Witamy w Akademii Pszczelarza. Dzisiaj naszym gościem jest Ralf Bischler z Instytutu Pszczelarstwa w Kielsień. Hello. For a little warming up, maybe you will say, you will say uh, tell us what you are doing uh, on your daily basic work. I'm head of the Bee Institute in Kirchhain, which is a training station, educational center for beekeepers in the central part of Germany. And at the same time, we do a lot of research with honeybees. We keep about 300 bee colonies and they are all involved in different research projects. So the main focus is on bee breeding, bee genetics, but also the treatment of varroa is an important subject, especially with biological, biotechnical methods. And then finally, there's some research going on on the effect of pesticides on, on the health of honeybees. So side effects of neonicotinoids and, and these subjects. So all important uh, things for beekeepers. Uh, you mentioned that you study genetics. So I read some of your papers and uh, you point out how important is biodiversity in Apis mellifera uh, species. Mm. Could you tell more what is dangerous uh, in, in this fact or uh, what is the plan for the future, how to, ma how to maintain this biodiversity? Yeah. First of all, we see a lot of natural races of honeybees throughout Europe and within the races we can distinguish quite a number of uh, different ecotypes and this is a product of natural selection and that shows already uh, the best bee depend very much on the local conditions, on the environment, on the climate, on, on the food supply. And bees need to be well adapted to the ecological uh, situation of, of the location, to be vital, to be healthy, to be productive at the end. And for this reason, uh, the best bee can only be selected and developed on the spot where it's going to be kept by the beekeepers. The problem is bees made in the open and over quite long distances. So whenever you bring in bees which are not well adapted, you can't uh, prevent that drones and queens will mate and in the next and over next generation you get hybrids and often those hybrids are bad adapted and they may show bad characters which the beekeepers don't like. So it's always a risk if you import bees and if you mix bees which don't belong together. And that's why we prefer local breeding activities. But of course in modern times beekeepers depend on productive bees. Gentleness is an important aspect. We want to work with our bees without protection, without getting stung and of course uh, disease resistance is a very important aspect nowadays because we really face big problems with varroa and certain virus diseases which costs us a lot of colony losses during winter time so often we have 10, 15, sometimes 20 percent of the colony lost per winter and this is a huge economical loss but also ecological loss. And uh, we think the best way for a sustainable solution is to select bees which cope much better with these diseases, so which are, can better resist. And we see that there are large differences, so there is high potential for selection in this direction, but it has to be done. You mentioned about uh, hybrids and in Poland it's uh, very popular to bring hybrid, uh, hybrid bees or artificial races. Do you think that it may cause the problems with uh, this resistance for diseases or genetic problems with bees? First of all, we have to distinct hybrids are bees which, where you cross genetically different parents to get a hybrid product which might be very productive or which might be very active. But when you go to uh, <coughs> propagate or rear offspring from this, the offspring will be different because it splits up. So this is a hybrid. And some beekeeper using this because in the first generation you have this heterosis effect which can be positive, but then it's lost afterwards. And at the end you get more problems than profit. 
It's a bit different thing with artificial rays. So we have natural races in Europe, as I mentioned before. And then at the moment I think there's only one race, one artificial race, and that is the Buckfast bee. And of course this bee is spread widely throughout Europe because especially professional beekeepers sometimes like this bee. It's very gentle and built strong colonies. So it can be a good bee for the professional honey production. But at the end it also contributes to problems because if you bring it in and it mix with the local carnica bees or local mellifera bees which you have in the country then you don't be sure what you get how the outcome of these crossbreeds is and therefore I think on the long term it's probably not the best way Buckfast bees can be very good they can be very good for the single beekeeper and he can by new queens all the time and, and is then always is satisfied. But in the surrounding where you have beekeepers who don't breed and who don't introduce new queens, they may get problems. And usually the best way for the whole beekeeping community is to agree on one specific breed which is locally adapted and which can be improved by selection. So simply what you are telling there is the conflict of economical uh, matter Mm. with long-term thinking about big community, communities and, and so on. It, it can be a conflict. It shouldn't be a conflict on a long term. On, on a long term perspective, the best adapted bee is the most resistant, is the most cost efficient and is the most productive. But the challenge is to run this selection. You have to select bees to get a very productive one for your place and the selection is, takes time and, and is work so it's not so easy to, to do and beekeepers have to learn this. So we have to educate breeders and they have to know the techniques and then it's a fascinating thing that you can imp improve the genetics of your own bees and you will be proud on, on your local product but this has to be achieved first. You are talking about this breeding and selection and for single bre uh, simple uh, beekeeper it may sound really difficult. Do you think that single uh, beekeeper with little bit knowledge or that uh, want to learn can do such thing as selection in, in his environment? Yeah, they all contribute. Each beekeeper contributes to the selection first of all and many do not recognize but at the moment, for example, where I have a, a Varroa susceptible colony, which, where I have a huge build-up of mites within a season, and you take the drug to kill the mites, then you help such a susceptible colony to survive. And the effect is, next year, the drones of this susceptible colony will mate the young weeds, and you select for susceptibility. So that is something which beekeepers have to learn. And each beekeeper can decide, I'm satisfied with this hive, then it can remain, or it is aggressive, or it is highly infested with varroa, or it is non-productive, and then please take out the queen and replace it with a queen from a better hive. That can be from your own location, or this queen can come from breeders around who do even a more uh, improved selection. So I think that is the main point, that uh, every beekeeper built his own future and build the future of next generation of beekeepers. But you mentioned about varroa resistance. Uh, and before that you said that you are working to breed such uh, bees. Could you tell us more about uh, how it is done? The challenging thing in, in selection for diseases is that you have to have the disease in your hive. So when we select for varroa resistance, we need varroa mites in the hive. And we cannot treat all the time. So what we do is that uh, we try to observe the development of the colony and uh, the increase of the mite population over a long period without treatment. And this is not, not so easy because you want to be sure that you don't lose too many hives. But in the meantime, we know some threshold levels and we know how to observe the mite development that we 
still treat in time. And this is basically what we are doing. We, we start with groups of colonies which are equally infested, equally strong in the beginning, and then we observe them, how they develop over a whole year's time without treatment. And in addition to this, we, we run specific tests, for example, for, on the so-called prude hygiene behavior. We know that um, resistant bees are able to detect infested prude cells, and some of the bees then open the cell, take out the mite, sometimes take out the brood. And this is one specific character which we want to increase in the hives. So we have some, some testing routine for this hygiene behavior. And this is regarded when we select colonies. So this is the most promising thing, that hy this hygiene behavior. Uh, it's not only hygiene, it's several tolerance or resistance characters in hives, which we have to regard, but hy hygiene behavior is definitely one of the most important. I'm going to ask you a very difficult question, and I've, I'm uh, aware that there will be no simple uh, answer for that, but every beekeeper uh, would ask this question. How long we need to uh, wait for this new breed of uh, bees resistant to varroa? I'm not a prophet, so <laughs> it's really a difficult question to say and it depends very much on the interaction between the breeders who may do an excellent job and identify high, uh, colonies with a high resistance, but then also the wider beekeeping community who have to spread those queens and to have to kill the queens which are more susceptible, which I mentioned before. So all the beekeepers participate in the game. And at the moment, we have the stupid situation that uh, beekeepers are used to treat their colonies once, twice, sometimes three times a year with medicine against varroa. And that's the way how they keep the infestation low. And then they are satisfied. Okay, we don't have a big problem. But the point is, if we work like this, we will have susceptible colonies still in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. And as a breeder, we think in generations. I want to be sure that my children can work with bees without using drugs. And this is a very realistic goal. If we all decide to go in this direction, I'm quite sure within the next 10, 15 years, we could have bees where we don't have to treat anymore. But this has to be followed then. So this is really important that we are this generation that uh, need to work hard to maintain this, uh, to maintain bees as a species. Exactly. And it is our duty to sometimes say, okay, we need to sacrifice some families, mm. but is, this is good for next generations of beekeepers, right? Exactly. I remember when, when I started with beekeeping as a young person, we had very aggressive bees and it was really hard to work with them. Nowadays we are used to get not stung at all when we work on the bees. So it's a tremendous change within 25, 30 years. So one generation. And we got these gentle bees from our fathers and we have the chance to give resistant bees to our children. I think that uh, this is the best uh thing that you can say uh, at the end of our conversation and thank you very much for this interview. Thank you very much for your interest.